Luke. Uh, feast of St. Luke the Evangelist is taken from the second epistle of St. Paul to the Corinthians, chapter 8. Brethren, I give thanks to God, who hath given the same carefulness for you in the heart of Titus. For indeed, he accepted the exhortation. But being more careful of his own will, he went unto you. We have sent also with him the brother whose praise is in the gospel through all the churches, and not o that only, but he was also ordained by the church's companion of our travels for this grace, which is administered by us to the glory of the Lord and our determined will. Avoiding this, lest any man should blame us in this abundance which is administered by us, for we forecast what may be good not only before God, but also before men. And we have sent with them our, our brother also, whom we have proved diligent in many things, but now much more diligent with much confidence in you, either for Titus, who is my companion and fellow laborer toward you, or our brethren, the apostles of the churches, the glory of Christ. Wherefore, show ye to them in the sight of the churches the evidence of your charity and of our boasting on your behalf. Please stand for the Holy Gospel. <clears throat> the Gospel is taken from that according to St. Luke, chapter 10, verses 1 to 9. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. At that time the Lord appointed also other seventy-two, and he sent them two and two before his face into every city and place whither he himself was to come. And he himself was, and he said to them, The harvest indeed is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he send laborers into his harvest. Go, behold, I send you as lambs among the wolves. Carry neither purse, nor scrip, nor shoes, and salute no man by the way. Into whatever house you enter, first say, Peace be to this house. And if the Son of Peace be there, your peace shall rest upon him. But if not, it shall return to you. And in the same house remain, eating and drinking such things as they have. For the laborer is worthy of his hire. Remove not from house to house, and into what city soever you enter, and they receive you, eat such things as are set before you. And... Heal the sick that are therein, and say to them, The kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. Thus far the words of today's Holy Gospel. Please be seated. He said to them, The harvest indeed is great, but the laborers are few. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. My dear faithful, we have the feast of St. Luke today, the evangelist, one of the two evangelists who were not apostles. We know of St. Mark, the other, who actually recorded by his own hand the preaching of St. Peter there in the house of the Roman senator, Pudens. But St. Luke, the other evangelist who was not an apostle, had to learn the gospel from them. But he was inspired by God to write down what he had heard. So we have that that Gospel of St. Luke now is our third Gospel. He was also inspired to write down the Acts of the Apostles. Now, the Gospel according to St. Luke is the longest of the Gospels. We've divided the Gospel of St. Matthew into 28 chapters. And although the Gospel according to St. Luke is divided only into 24 chapters, they're rather lengthy. And so, the Gospel of St. Luke is the longest of the four Gospels. <laughs> In fact, if one were to take the Gospel of St. Luke and join it to the Acts of the Apostles, you would find that those two books written by St. Luke are about as long as all 14 epistles of St. Paul. And uh, as a matter of fact, also longer than the seven other epistles and uh, the Book of the Apocalypse. So the Gospel according to St. Luke is rather prolific. It's, it uh, tells us a great deal of information, but it tells it to us in a certain way. 
Why? Because God uses the instrument that he chooses in the way that he has fashioned it. And St. Luke was fashioned in a very unique way. He was a pagan. St. Mark, St. Matthew, before him, St. Saint John, they were all born of Jews, and they, were all, they all grew up subject to the law of Moses. They knew all of the prescriptions of the Jewish law and so on, the Jewish way of life. St. Luke was not from Jerusalem. He was rather quite far away from there. He was from Antioch, far to the north. And Antioch was a kind of crossroads of cultures of all kinds. The Hebrews would have been known there too, but they would have been one of many voices and rather loud voices too, because Antioch was known to be a rather turbulent city. It was a good sized city for the time, but it was a crossroads of many cultures from the East and the West, the Greek and so on, dominating the discourse there. And the Antiochians were known to be rather spirited people, a lot of controversies and more than controversies. Later on, even Arius the priest who would start the Arian heresy, would originate in Antioch and come down to Alexandria, where he became known for his heresy against our Lord and his divinity. So Antioch was a seething town of many, many different strident and discordant opinions. It was to Antioch that St. Peter was first sent by God, and he ruled Antioch, the city of Antioch, as its bishop, St. Peter did, for seven years before he went to Rome. In fact, when St. Peter left Antioch to go to Rome, it was because the people of Rome were calling him, the Christians were begging him to come to them because a man had come among them and was adulterating the teaching of the gospel. It was a magician named Simon. You read about him in the Acts of the Apostles. St. Luke wrote about him. So St. Peter had to leave Antioch after seven years of presiding over the church there in order to come and rescue the gospel in Antioch from the machinations of this certain Simon the Magician. And there St. Peter assumed the reins, the government of the church throughout the world, Bishop of Rome, and uh, he dwelt there for 25 years to be martyred there and die there. It's important, though, to remember that he was bishop in Antioch for seven years, and St. Luke originated. He began in Antioch as a Christian, and it may well be that during those seven years, St. Luke came into contact with St. Peter and actually learned the faith from him. In any case, he mentions himself as appearing on the the service of the apostles only later on. And um, you notice that um, even in the gospel today, there are references to him. This uh, The epistle, I should say, the second epistle of St. Paul to the Corinthians mentions St. Luke, not by name, but it does mention him. This is why the church has given this epistle to us today. Because St. Paul is writing to the Corinthians a second letter and he talks about sending them Titus. He talks about how Titus, well, actually I should explain this. I realize that the English translation can be rather confusing. And uh, this is one of those epistles that is much clearer in, the, in Latin than it is in English, and probably even clearer in Greek for those who are conversant with Greek. But when they take and they translate into another language, sometimes the, the words in the original language have a certain meaning, a certain aura about them that makes things very clear. But it's very difficult to find those words with exactly the same nuance in a second language. So the translator has to struggle sometimes to convey the original meaning. So don't be surprised if when you read this English, it might be a little obscure in places. It's much clearer in the Latin and uh, probably in the original Greek, because it was originally written in Greek. <clears throat> but notice that St. Paul is sending to the, to the Corinthians Titus and a companion. And that companion is someone who, who is praised in the church. He's known and he's praised 
in the gospel. In other words, he's not mentioned the gospel, but because of the gospel that he's written, because of the gospel that he's written down and is there read in the missions, this particular companion of Titus isn't well known to the to the Christians of that time. His praise is in the gospel, as Saint Saint Paul says, through all the churches, and uh, talks about him also. This other companion of Saint Titus, companion of Saint Paul, going to them, the Corinthians, with his own will. He wanted to do the will of God. He was ordered to go. He was told to go with Titus, but he embraced that mission himself. He was enthusiastic to go to the Corinthians, and that was, well, that was St. Luke. And he mentions him again, again, toward the end of this passage. He talks about the fellow laborers, right, with Titus and others who work with St. Paul in the gospel. And among them, prominent would be St. Luke. St. Luke was a physician by training. So he was an educated man. Even among the Greeks, he was an educated man. And when you read the gospel according to him, and when you read the Acts of the Apostles, and you see the terminology he uses, the mode of expression he uses in the Greek, you see that he was a a skillful man at language. And uh, he could express himself very well. Now, St. Luke also was very familiar with the customs of the Hebrews, uh, perhaps because of instructions by the apostles, he had become familiar with that. Or perhaps there was something else involved. You know, in the earliest days of the church, the uh, converts were mostly Jews, and the pagans who embraced faith in Christ had to become Jewish first. The earliest converts were so possessive of our Lord that they claimed they had rights to him, in a sense, and that no one could come to our Lord except they came through Moses. And so many of the earliest converts from paganism were required to first come to, let's say, Judaism, and through Judaism learn about the Messiah, who was promised to come to us through Judaism. It was only after six years that St. Peter first baptized an entire family of Greeks, Gentiles, pagans, directly into the faith of Christ without requiring them to go through the Jewish channels first. And then he had to defend that. He had to defend what he did at the Council of the Apostles. It was called precisely to address the question in the year 51 AD. And there it was decided, guided by St. Peter, that no, those who embrace faith in Christ, embrace the Savior, they don't have to embrace the law of Moses. The law of Moses cannot save anyone. And Moses existed, his whole vocation was to point the way to our Lord Jesus Christ. So those who found our Lord did not need to go through Moses to get to Jesus. This was council that cited, this was the finding of the councils of the apostles in Jerusalem in the year 51 AD. Now, St. Luke might well have embraced the faith before that decision was made. He might have been one of those who had to be trained also in the Jewish ways, and perhaps that explains why he was so conversant with them. Even perhaps before he was admitted to, to be a Christian. In any case, he did what was necessary. He did what he was called upon to do in order to follow our Lord Jesus Christ. He became a great companion and servant of so many in the faith, and finally St. Paul recognized him as his best companion. Sometimes even he would be his only companion. When St. Paul was in prison, who would go to visit him? Perhaps it might only be St. Luke. And St. Luke went to see him, bringing certain skills with him. I mean, St. Luke had witnessed many miracles of healing, and he would appreciate them protect in a, perhaps in a special way, because he was, after all, a physician. And he knew what it was to treat the human body and try to coax it back to health again. Perhaps he, above all, was in a position to appreciate the miraculous nature of these miracles of healing. And he would have seen them. He would have seen them performed by St. Paul and others as well. But St. Luke would go into the dungeon. He wouldn't only go on these travels with St. Paul. He would even go into the dungeon with him. And there St. Luke would record in his own hand, in Greek, the, preach, the words of St. Paul, 
recording his correspondence, his letters to the Corinthians, and his letters to the other, the others, including the Hebrews, the last of the epistles of St. Paul, I think it was probably written by St. Luke, in the dungeon where St. Paul was being held. And then he would not only append these, but uh, because St. Paul could not do so for himself, perhaps his eyes were dim in the dark light of the dungeon or his hands were chained up. So he required, required St. Luke to do this for him. And then St. Luke would go from that prison and take the words of St. Paul into the missions of the time, the chapels, the Christian communities that had been established in these various cities, eagerly awaited word from St. Paul, whom they regarded as a great teacher of the faith and a great father of the faith. They looked to him with a great affection, a great affection also. So you see the services rendered by St. Luke were considerable. And the church honors him to this day because as you read in the epistle of the day, his praise is in the gospel throughout the churches, and so it remains to this day. The gospel that he's provided for us remains with us throughout all of these centuries, and we thank God for that. We read some of that today for the gospel of this Mass. Now, regarding this day that you and I live in today, we we find, uh, rather than converting from paganism to true belief in Christ, the world is largely apostatizing, and many, many in the world are losing their faith. They're being misled, notably by Francis, even, in the Vatican, who is giving them a false gospel, as St. Paul wrote to the Galatians. Yes, even an angel from heaven, if it would come and give you a false gospel, let it be anathema to you. And so we are not here to receive a false gospel, but the true gospel on the feast of an evangelist who wrote down the true gospel of Christ. We have a strange situation going on today as we are, actually have a man running for the presidency of the United States of America who touts his Catholicism, who wants to be known as a Catholic, who wants to be received as a Catholic, who's appealing for the Catholic vote. And, you know, not so long ago, those who ran for office and were known as Catholics were penalized for it. They were, in a sense, held up to ridicule and even charged that they would use their or abuse the office by following a Catholic conscience to make decisions. We have a strange situation today where we have someone who's nominated for the Supreme Court who is being confronted with the idea that the dogma speaks loudly in her life, as uh, one Jewish senator accused her uh, of being having faith in Christ. Um, but at the same time, she is being opposed by a man who is running for the presidency who claims that he is a great Catholic. But the people who are who are actually blasting this candidate for the Supreme Court for her Catholicism are actually rejoicing in the so-called Catholicism of the very man they're shoving forward to become the future president of the United States of America. And so what is going on here? Why is one Catholicism so different from the other? Why is one acceptable and one not? And the answer you understand is very, very, very clear to us here although it is not clear to others, it is very clear to us here that the one Catholicism, even though unfortunately it represents the Novus Ordo, it represents the conservative aspect of the Novus Ordo, which still retains vestiges of the faith, the true faith. And the other, the other is not Catholicism at all. It is simply a false religion of the left and stands for all of the things, all of the sacred, the things that the left holds sacred, abortion and homosexuality and all the other things, all the other evils and perversions, that this is the quote-unquote Catholicism put forth by them. It's kind of surprising in a way, but, but you know, for us who realize the importance of our faith, the central, the central person in all history, that of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the very person of the Son of God, 
we realize we are here on, on the edge of a precipice, as it's been called, and the dispute seems to be coming down to what is real Catholicism? And how could it be otherwise? I mean, we realize that what is at stake here? We realize what's involved here. This is a spiritual warfare. And so ironically enough, while the world seems to be rejecting faith and so on, the central point really, the, the central argument seems to be at this point, what is genuine faith and what is really Catholicism? That represented by the Democratic nominee for the presidency of the United States of America, or that represented, however it is, by the nominee for the Supreme Court. And on top of it all, overriding it all, as it were, overseeing it all, we have Francis. And which of the two of the nominee of the Supreme Court, or the nominee for the presidency, which of these two somehow represents what he believes, Francis? What he teach, what he what he teaches, what he wants, what he promotes. You know, we see his latest encyclical, Fratelli Tutti, and we see that it is actually praised by the Freemasons as representing the Freemasonic program for brotherhood of the, in the world. We see the encyclical of Francis, his third encyclical, speaking out against private property and for communal property. In other words, very, very, very vaguely and very thinly veiled communism. And this encyclical coming out just at a time when we're on the verge of this election here in the United States of America. Truly, Joseph Biden could make a case, couldn't he? That he's not more Catholic than the Pope. He could say that. Or the Pope is not more Catholic than he is, for that matter, either way. One could argue either way here. But this is the situation we're in right now. And even though the circumstances in the world today and the circumstances that beset the church can be very, very uh, discouraging for those who don't have a strong faith, really, if they, if they understood more deeply, if they understood the significance of what was happening, they'd say, but this is exactly the warfare that our Lord predicted. This, his words are being realized. His words are actually coming to pass. And rather than causing us to doubt, they should confirm in our minds the reality of the faith, the truth of the faith, because ultimately it must come down to that battle. Ultimately it has to come down to that struggle between faith and anti-faith. In our case, we see it in the Catholic faith and modernism opposed to each other, mutually arrayed against each other. We see it in the Catholic faith against leftism, progressivism, socialism, all the rest, those who would take the gospel and turn it into the social or the socialist gospel. That there is an absolute enmity between these two things. They are diametrically opposed to each other, and they will be in battle. One will prevail, and the other will be crushed. Well, you and I know what that will be. As we see this whole issue rising before us, even now, it should confirm our faith and make us realize that exactly what our Lord has said is being carried out right now. And we know how this ends. and We know who has the victory. Our Lord said to his apostles that they should not be afraid because he has overcome the world. And so we need to keep that in mind even now. We are approaching here the magnificent feast of the kingship of Christ. A feast that was established in 1925. You're going to find it a week from now. It'll be the Sunday Mass of next Sunday. And in 1925, Pope Pius XI issued the feast of Christ the King in order to reassert the fact that Jesus Christ, the Son of God and Son of Man, is by right the king of every single human soul here on this earth, whoever lived, now lives, or ever will live. By right, and he has that right, two sources. By virtue of who he is as God made man, and what he's done in giving his life on the cross to redeem us. He has absolute right to our allegiance, our loyalty, our love, our obedience, not only ours, but that of all mankind. 
And the fact that somebody will not give that to him does not take away anything at all from the right that he actually has and the right that will finally prevail in the end. As all are judged by him as their king. Now, my dear people, we have this feast coming up. We have the feast then of All Saints Day coming up. And we have the Feast of All Souls. And there you find the church is brought together. The church militant here on earth, the church triumphant in heaven, and the church suffering in purgatory. They're all united in these three feasts. So I ask you to please reassert your faith, reaffirm your faith. Pray. Pray as you should. But pray with confidence to Almighty God. Pray for your country. Pray for your family. Pray for your own souls. Ask God to inspire you. His purpose is to, to justify from sin and to sanctify the human soul. Those who are in the state of mortal sin become justified. Go to him, offer that apology, the simple apology and the confessional. Receive absolution. Be in the state of grace. And then God can raise you up. Then, and only then, can he glorify you. But pray for our country, because our country also is guilty of many very, very grave sins. There are those who have legislated these evil things and put them into place. There are those then who are carrying them out and enforcing them. And there are those who are watching and letting this happen. And they all share in guilt for these horrible crimes. So we must pray that God will first justify our country from its evils, deliver our country from its sins. And to pray for that, we have to work for that too, by opposing what is evil here. There are no sidelines here. You're on the field. You're on the field. Every single one of us is on the field, and we are engaged. If we're not engaged, then we're engaged for the enemy. But we're engaged one way or the other. And so we have to work. We have to labor for the justification of our country from its sins so that we can pray that God will glorify our country too and visit it with his grace. God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.